Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Guess what? Yeah, you guys guessed it. Yep. Yeah, we're we're doing another sort of RTX 3080 related video. Surprise! But uh, yeah, this one's a little bit different because as you guys know, I have been talking quite a bit about PCI Express 4.0 and the role it will play with the new uh, GeForce 30 series. I guessed, I suspected there might be a small performance advantage with higher end parts such as the RTX, well, 3080 and 3090 when using PCI Express 4.0 over 3.0. I was guessing somewhere like a 5% performance uplift. I did take a very brief look at this in our day one review and found that at most we were looking at just a 3% uplift. So basically nothing in other words. Still, I had planned to take a more in-depth look at PCIe performance with the RTX 3080. So that is what we're going to do today. But before we get to all the benchmarks, today's video sponsor is MSI and their award-winning B550 Gaming Edge Wi-Fi motherboard, the ultimate companion for the latest AMD Ryzen processors. It comes equipped with Wi-Fi 6, lightning fast PCIe Gen 4, 2.5 gigabits per second networking and outstanding VRM performance. This really is a board that does it all. When paired with the 8 core 16 thread AMD Ryzen 7 3700X processor, you've got yourself a formidable system for gaming, content creation and productivity. So no matter the task, MSI's B550 motherboards along with AMD's Ryzen processors have you covered. Enjoy more cores and more performance today via the links in the video description. Okay, so we'll be looking at quite a few different PCI Express configurations using the Ryzen 9 3950X on the X570 platform using MSI's X570 Unify motherboard, as well as the Intel Core i9 10900K on a Z490 motherboard using MSI's Z490 Unify. In both instances, we're using 32 gigabytes of DDR4 3200CL14 memory, and the graphics card of choice is of course the the RTX 3080, as you would have no doubt guessed by this point. And of course, we are using the Founders Edition model. I'm not going to waste time talking about PCI Express buses and the available bandwidth and all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to assume that you guys know pretty much all of that stuff at this point. And for those of you who don't, you know how to use Google. So yeah, we're going to skip that part of the video. And without wasting any time, we're just going to get straight into the benchmarks and we'll start with the Ryzen 9 3950X results. Starting with Death Stranding, we see basically no difference in performance between PCIe 4.0 and 3.0 when running at full bandwidth in the Time 16 mode. Now, in the highly unlikely scenario that you're running at PCIe 3.0 times 8 on an X570 or B550 motherboard, there is a performance hit, particularly to the 1% low performance, where we saw up to an 11% drop in frame rate at 1440p. Though typically we're looking at more like a 7% dip in performance. Moving on, here we see despite being very visually impressive, Shadow of the Tomb Raider doesn't really eat up a lot of PCIe bandwidth, and as a result we see basically no change in performance. Even when going from PCIe 3.0 times 8 bandwidth right up to PCIe 4.0 times 16 bandwidth. And it's a similar story when testing with Rainbow Six Siege. Here we're seeing an insignificant 2.5% performance drop off at 1080p when changing the PCIe version from 4.0 to 3.0 and then a further 2% drop when switching to 8x bandwidth. So nothing really to see here. F1 2020 is yet another title that isn't noticeably impacted by PCI Express bandwidth, and it's not until we drop down to PCI 3.0 times 8 that we see some kind of performance loss at 1440p and 4K. Interestingly though, it is again 1440p that takes the biggest hit, but we are only talking about a 6% drop off for this unlikely configuration. Horizon Zero Dawn has proven to be more PCIe sensitive than most other titles we've tested in the past, but even here we're seeing very little difference between PCIe 3.0 and 4.0. In fact, we only start to see a reduction in frame rate with PCIe 3.0 times 8. We already know that Resident Evil 3 isn't at all CPU sensitive, at least within reason, and it doesn't appear to be very PCIe bandwidth sensitive either. Again, we're seeing virtually no difference between PCIe 3.0 and 4.0. The Doom Eternal results are quite interesting, mostly because we're pushing really high frame rates in this title. You'll often see the biggest performance differences when it comes to PCIe performance at higher frame rates, and this is because bus transfers are fairly consistent per frame regardless of the resolution, meaning that the frame rate is the primary driver of PCIe bandwidth. Now, we're seeing that the threshold for PCIe 3.0 times 8 in this title appears to be just over 300 FPS while time 16 will allow for almost 360 FPS 
and PCIe 4.0 times 16 doesn't really limit the 3950X, allowing for 368 FPS on average. Still, we're again only talking about an insignificant 3% reduction in performance from PCIe 4.0 to 3.0. Wolfenstein Youngblood does behave very similarly to what we saw in Doom Eternal, so again, while we are seeing a reduction in performance with PCIe 3.0 times 16, the margins are somewhat meaningless. Now, for those of you wondering, enabling a technology like DLSS doesn't change anything here. We're looking at similar margins to that of native performance. I've also seen a lot of people claiming that ray tracing uses a lot of PCI Express bandwidth, but I'm not sure what that's based on. So for those of you wondering, here are the DLSS plus ray tracing numbers, and if anything, it seems to reduce the need for PCIe bandwidth as it lowers the frame rate. Now here's a quick look at how the RTX 3080 performs with the Z490 slash 10900K combo using PCI Express 3.0 times 16 and times 8 bandwidth. Here we're looking at a 5% reduction in average frame rate at 1080p with a 10% reduction in 1% low performance. Even at 4K, we're seeing a 6% drop in average frame rate with a 10% drop for the 1% low performance. So that is quite significant and it is a relative statistic for some users, which we'll get to shortly. As we saw previously with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, this total doesn't require a great deal of PCIe bandwidth, and we're again seeing that here with at most a 5% drop in performance when halving the PCIe 3.0 bandwidth. And the same thing is true of Rainbow Six Siege, PCIe bandwidth really doesn't matter here, especially when gaming at 1440p and 4K. We do see a small performance penalty from halving the available PCIe bandwidth from PCIe 3.0 times 16 to times 8 with F1 2020. Here we're seeing up to a 6% decrease at 1080p, 5% at 1440p, and nothing at 4K. And we see similar performance margins in Horizon Zero Dawn. Here the reduction in PCIe 3.0 bandwidth reduced performance by up to 5% at 1080p and 4% at 1440p with no change to the 4K data. Here we're seeing a 5% drop in performance at 1080p in Resident Evil 3, with no noteworthy changes at 1440p or 4K. Now we're again finding some pretty interesting results in Doom Eternal. Previously when using the 3950X, we found that PCIe 3.0x8 bandwidth limits the RTX 3080 to around 320fps at 1080p, and we're again seeing that here with the 10900K. As a result, we're looking at a massive 18% reduction in performance at 1080p, but little change to the 1440p and 4K data as we're under that 320fps cap. Okay, so admittedly much of that data wasn't terribly surprising, but you know, I enjoy doing these tests and I also enjoy going over the data, so hopefully you guys do as well. But having looked at what we've looked at now, there is one area where we can sort of mix these results together and it's quite interesting what we're about to look at anyway. So I won't say too much more, but basically the PCI Express 3.0 times 8 data for most AMD systems is somewhat pointless to look at, even though we did just look at it. So that was sort of done in the name of science. Though again, it might be useful information for those of you using 300 and 400 series motherboards with multiple PCIe devices. And that information is a lot more relevant to Intel users as there's no way to avoid PCIe 3.0 times 8 bandwidth for your primary PCIe slot if you ever wish to use the secondary slot. Now, I realize a lot of people just leave the second slot vacant. They don't put anything in it. Um, that's certainly been the experience with a lot of my friends. So I'm not trying to pretend that this is something that affects everybody or even the majority of Intel users. Uh, that certainly isn't the case. And to find out just how many of you are running a second or even a third PCIe device, I created a poll. And as I suspected, based on my sample of friends and other people that I've seen building and using their computers over the years, the vast majority of people install a graphics card in the primary slot, and that's pretty much the only expansion card that they put in their entire system. Still, we did see roughly 25% of all users uh, do install a second uh, PCIe device, uh, whether that be something like a sound card, additional storage, a capture card, a high-speed networking, or really any kind of expansion card, it doesn't matter. Uh, it could be a PCIe card with a single USB port, 
doesn't matter. As soon as you install a card in that secondary slot, no matter whether it's a one times card, a two times card, four times card, as I said, doesn't matter what it's doing, it will instantly halve the bandwidth to the primary slot. That's just how it works. And that will force you to run at PCIe 3.0 times eight on even a flagship Z490 motherboard, for example. However, if you happen to install a secondary expansion card of any description on say an X570 motherboard, that will actually limit you to PCIe 4.0 times eight bandwidth when using something like an RTX 3080, basically a graphics card that supports PCI Express 4.0. And that is the equivalent to PCIe 3.0 times 16 bandwidth. So there's no real performance hit there. Anyway, as I said, this isn't something that most of you seem to do. So I'm not trying to create an unrealistic scenario to limit the performance of the Intel systems. I'm just trying to show you what does happen in that scenario for what looks like about 25% of our viewers. Starting with Death Stranding, we're now seeing a situation where Intel no longer enjoys a small performance advantage at 1080p and 1440p with the RTX 3080. Instead, when running both CPUs in an eight times by eight times configuration for the primary and secondary PCIe slots, we're seeing comparable performance on both platforms with slightly better 1% lows for the 3950X. Then at 4K, the 3950X pulled ahead by a 3% margin, which is a somewhat meaningless margin, but it was consistently a few frames faster under these conditions. Previously, we saw that AMD already had a fairly small performance advantage in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, so limiting the 10900K by using PCIe 3.0 times eight allows the 3950X to deliver 6% more performance at 1440p and 5% more at 4K. Again, not exactly huge margins, but here we're looking at another title where AMD is actually the superior gamer if you use the second PCIe slot. However, Intel does enjoy a performance advantage in Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege when using the Time 16 mode, and that advantage isn't entirely eroded with the more limited Times 8 bandwidth. The 10900K still allowed for 8% more frames at 1080p and 3% more at 1440p. So the small performance hit to the 10900K seen when going from Times 16 to Times 8 bandwidth really isn't a big deal here. Previously, the 10900K was 13% faster than the 3950X in F1 2020 at 1080p. And here we're only looking at a very minor change to that margin, reducing it to 11%. That said, the margin is now entirely eliminated at 1440p and 4K. And if anything, AMD now has a very small performance advantage here, though it's so small it is hardly worth noting. Now, due to the harsh CPU bottleneck at 1080p and Horizon Zero Dawn with the Ryzen 9 3950X, reducing the PCI bandwidth of the 10900K still sees it deliver 13% more performance, whereas at the full time 16 bandwidth, it was 19% faster. That said, we are seeing identical performance at 1440p and 4K. Of course, the Resident Evil 3 results, they don't really change because the game doesn't see a reduction in performance when using PCIe 3.0 times eight bandwidth. And it also saw the same level of performance using either the 3950X or the 10900K. The Doom Eternal results are again, very interesting, at least at 1080p. Unrestricted by the PCIe bandwidth, we've seen previously that the 10900K is 6% faster than the 3950X at 1080p with the RTX 3080. However, with a second PCIe device installed, it's now 10% slower, handing AMD the win. That said, performance is basically identical at 1440p and 4K. Okay, so in a nutshell, PCI Express 4.0 at this point in time does little to improve performance with the RTX 3080. Of course, it is possible that could change with future games, but for now at least, it appears not to be an issue. Now, the data seen when using the secondary PCIe times 16 slot, it's quite interesting, but again, I am aware that this is something that only around 25% of our audience do. Also, this is not something that AMD fanboys can use as a weapon to win those super important arguments on forums or Reddit. Again, this isn't a common configuration. It's not used by most people. And probably most importantly, the decrease in performance really isn't that noticeable. And on that note, AMD fans can't really have it both ways. Single digit margins can't be significant when they favor your preferred hardware brand. And it's even questionable as to how relevant the 11% win for the 3950X was in Doom Eternal at 1080p, as we're talking about 321 FPS versus 357 FPS. All that said, it is worth noting that when using the secondary PCIe slot, 
the PCIe 4.0 enabled 3950X was almost always as fast or faster than the 10900K, albeit by a rather insignificant margin. But the point is, if you wish to take full advantage of the expansion options your PC offers, you're best off doing so on a platform supporting PCI Express 4.0 to avoid any bandwidth bottlenecks. And that is going to do it for this one. If you liked the video, I reckon you guys know what to do. You can also subscribe if you want to see more of these hardware unboxed videos. And you can also join us over on Patreon. We have a link for that in the top of the video description or pretty, pretty well up there. So if you're interested in that, check it out. It'll give you access to our exclusive Discord server, the Harbor Unboxed server, or all our community hangout and chat. Tim and myself are often in there. We do live streams. We'll have a live stream coming up, I think, next week on the channel. Yeah, it'll be next week on the channel. We'll definitely do that. Q&As, behind the scenes videos. Anyway, it's pretty cool. If you're interested, check it out. But if not, that's fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching another one of our RTX 3080 related videos. Uh, there's probably going to be a few more of them, then a few 3090 videos, then hopefully next month a few 3070 videos, and then maybe AMD will have some products for us. But there's plenty to look at, plenty of, plenty more testing to do. I've just got a list this long, so I better wrap this up and get into the next video. So, thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.